Good afternoon. My name is Christopher Adams, and as the rector of St. Paul's College, I welcome everyone to our first of three lectures for the 2021 Hanley Lecture Series. Before we begin, I want to state that St. Paul's College, the University of Manitoba, and our city of Winnipeg sit at the crossroads of the Anishinaabe, Métis, Cree, Dakota, and OG Cree nations. We acknowledge specifically that we are in Treaty 1 territory and on the traditional lands of the Anishinaabe peoples and the homeland of the Métis Nation. We are committed to the pathways of reconciliation. We hope all those participating in today's lecture are able to join St. Paul's College in these endeavors. I join with my colleagues at St. Paul's College in welcoming Dr. Kathleen Sprouse Cummings as our 2020-2021 Hanley Lecturer. Before I introduce you to Dr. Cummings, I want to say a few words about the Hanley Lecture series and its creation. John Hanley, known by many as Jack, was born in Winnipeg in 1910. He attended St. Paul's for one year of the high school program and then St. Jerome's College in Waterloo, followed by the Grand Seminary in Montreal. At the age of 23, he entered the Society of Jesus in Guelph, Ontario. After studying philosophy at the Jesuit Seminary in Toronto, he was ordained a priest in 1945. After his studies, he returned to Winnipeg in 1949, where he taught both high school and university, co university courses at the college. From 1959 until the end of the 1960s, he taught only at St. Paul's College. At the early age of 60, he died of a brain tumor and his funeral mass was conducted in our St. Paul's College Christ the King Chapel. To honor the memory of Father John C. Hanley SJ, his friends and colleagues from St. Paul's College and the Department of Religion at the University of Manitoba established the Hanley Memorial Lecture Series. This prestigious Hanley Lecture Series annually brings to Winnipeg a prominent theologian, scripture, scripture scholar, or a leading authority on current religious issues. As you can see, due to the pandemic related challenges we now have, things are different this year. This year, we are spacing the lectures by having them given in the form of one per month that is in February, March, and April. I think this will give us a chance to ponder each lecture at a slower pace than in previous years. It'll be interesting to hear what people have to say when everything's concluded. Please be advised that this event will be recorded. At the end of the lecture, we will be able to pose questions and have the lecturer give some responses. Simply indicate your questions through the Q&A button on the Zoom or else via Facebook for those watching this via Facebook. Now, about this year's Hanley Lecture, Kathleen Sprose Cummings is Professor at American of American Studies and History at the University of Notre Dame, where she also directs the Kushwa Center for the Study of American Catholicism. Dr. Cummings holds a, con a concurrent appointment in Gender Studies and the Department of Theology. She is also an affiliated faculty member in Italian Studies and the Nanovic Institute for European Studies. Cummings' most recent book, A Saint of Our Own, and I have a copy here, actually I got it from our library, A Saint of Our Ho Own, How We Quest for a Holy Hero. Um, a Saint of Our Own was published by the University of North Carolina Press in 2019. This is one of her very many publications, including her first book, New Women of the Old Faith, Gender and American Catholicism in the Progressive Era. And this is the other one. This was also published by North Carolina Press in 2009. Dr. Cummings is often asked to comment in the media on issues pertaining to Catholicism and other areas of her expertise. This includes NBC, the New York Times, and just last Saturday, the Winnipeg Free Press. I now welcome Dr. Kathleen Sprose Cummings to give the first of three Henry Lectures for 2021. Good afternoon. Thank you, Dr. Adams, for that generous introduction, and even more so for the invitation to deliver the Hanley Lectures this year. I am truly honored. Thanks to everyone who helped organize these lectures twice when they were meant to happen in person last spring, just before the pandemic started. And of course, now virtually. I'm particularly grateful to Jason and Matt, our tech support, who make the magic happen. And while I'd rather be with all of you in person, I'm delighted to be with you in this capacity. I want to start by sharing my screen and just giving an overview of the lecture series. The three lectures focus broadly on the theme of seeking saints in the modern world. 
They focus on the modern canonization process, the elaborate and convoluted series of steps that the Catholic Church has relied on since the 16th century to affirm that certain men and women by virtue of practicing lives of extraordinary virtue now rest in God's eternal presence. The people who oversee this process for a saint are sometimes called saint makers. Their official term are the official term is postulators. And I'd like to start with a quotation from one of Winnipeg's native sons who served as the postulator in charge of Mother Teresa's cause. His name is Father Brian Kaleidachuk, and he is a redemptress priest who spent 17 years amassing evidence for Mother Teresa's canonization. Shortly before she was elevated, uh, shortly before she was named a saint, Father Brian gave an interview to the Winnipeg Free Press in which he compared the new saint to sports professionals, specifically to members of the Winnipeg Blue Bombers, the Winnipeg Jets, the role models of the kids that come for the autographs and all those things. Father Kalatichuk described Mother Teresa as a hero, pointing out that it's just like we have sports heroes and Hollywood heroes. Christians can also have our Christian heroes. The premise of these lectures is that by looking at who Catholics embrace as their holy heroes, we learn a lot about what they value and how those values change over time. And in fact, things change often very rapidly in this process. And while the lecture that I'm going to give this afternoon is not changed very much from what I intended to give last March. It is shortened in the sense that I think people can uh, tolerate shorter lectures online than they can in person. Um, but my subsequent lectures in the series, which focus on gender and canonization, and then the third lecture, which focuses on John Paul II and one of the many, many saints he canonized, I, I basically have rewritten since March to reflect some of the happenings of the last year. But let's begin with today's lecture, which focuses on North American Catholics. And I'm going to use the holy heroes to talk about the development of a national identity in the United States. But it starts out very much as a cooperative story between the United States and Canada. Scholars of medieval and early modern Europe have long understood that saints are really valuable uh, for their interpretive potential. They have studied how new models of holiness emerge in response, not just to papal prerogatives, but also to developments in the larger culture. And historians of the United States and Canada are relatively new to this endeavor. And although I am a historian of the United States, it will become clear that the history and hagiography hey of both countries are entwined. And in fact, I'm going to begin and end with a saint that we share. Katiri Tekakwita. Uh, I understand there is a parish in Winnipeg named after Tekakwita, and I understand that nine parishioners traveled there from Winnipeg to Rome for her canonization in 2012. I was also there, and I'll end today with speaking a little bit about that experience. But I want to start by talking about how and why she emerged as a candidate for canonization in the 1880s, and the meaning that she had for Catholics in the United States and in Canada, a meaning that is very different from the meaning she has today. I'm not going to focus so much on her life. You can see the dates there, but actually on her afterlife. Now, of course, for Catholics, canonization reflects a truth about an individual's afterlife in a quite literal sense, resting in God's eternal presence. But as a historian, I use the term afterlife figuratively and look at how saints live on in historic memory. All of the saints I'll speak of about, all of the saints I'll speak about today were nominated for canonization, not simply because they were, they were holy people, but because the Catholics whose lives they had touched and crucially for many beyond their immediate circle wanted to re have them remembered as holy people and went to a great deal of trouble and expense to ensure that they were. Again, to quote Father Kaleidachuk on the subject of Mother Teresa's elevation, canonization is for us, not for her. 
In other words, canonization changes nothing about the people so honored, merely certifying their heavenly status. What it does do is transform the relationship between the faithful and the saint. While Catholics may privately invoke any person, uh, they may invoke the intercession of any person they believe to be in God's presence. Acts of public veneration, novenas, celebrations of feast days, building of shrines, are reserved only for the canonized or in a limited capacity to those who have reached the penultimate stage of the process, beatification. In the early church, there had been no formal process of canonization. Saints were named by popular acclamation. But between the 10th and 17th centuries, the Holy See increasingly reserved to itself the right of canonization and eventually beatification. And this whole process, what we call the modern process, was in place by 1634. How saints pass through that process is a fascinating part of the story. But my focus is less on what happens in Rome and where a saint's holiness is validated. Um, and instead, it focuses on the local church, the culture from which the candidates emerged. Another way to say this is that I'm far less interested in the saint makers than I am in the saint seekers. Because holy men and women gain popular support in very specific contexts, studies of canonization can reveal as much about the priorities of the interests and people promoting the candidates as, it, as they do about the lives of the prospective saints themselves. What meaning they assign to their heroes and why they want them recognized in the first place is part of my story. Whenever a new saint is named, it is cause for rejoicing, a new point of access between, uh, the, between the faithful and uh, the communion of saints. I was very privileged to witness it firsthand, not for the first time at Tekic with his canonization in 2012, but in fact, uh, two years before in October of 2010, when I attended the canonization of Brother Andre Bissette, who became then the first member of the Congregation of Holy Cross, the congregation that sponsors the University of Notre Dame to be named a saint. So just a bit of comparison with the Jesuits, of course, who have many, many saints. Holy Cross did not have a canonized saint until this moment. I was able to travel there with some pilgrims from the University of Notre Dame, where we were joined by many pilgrims from Canada. And uh, you, on my first slide there, there was the Canadian flag, which was in abundance in the audience on that glorious October morning. Saints are rarely canonized alone. It's an elaborate ceremony, and therefore there's usually a bunch canonized on any given day. There's almost always an Italian. They have home field advantage. Um, but on that day, uh, the Brother Andre fans, like myself and uh, my Canadian friends, were legion. But we were dwarfed in exuberance by the 13,000 pilgrims who had traveled from across the world to attend the canonization of Mother Mary MacKillop, who became on that day, the first saint canonized from Australia. And as I said, while Canadians uh, certainly knew how to celebrate <laughs> the Australians, put all of us to shame. This is what got me thinking initially about the connection between sanctity and nationalism. And I wondered what it, would have been, what it had been like in earlier decades when the first saints from the United States and from Canada had been canonized. So that is where my story and my research started. And it was actually the first time I was able to research in the Vatican secret archives to get the story behind it there. This lecture, like so much else regarding canonization, uh, is dominated by Jesuits, beginning with the gentleman pictured here by the name of Reverend John Wynne. He's pictured alongside his favorite female candidate, Tekakwita. Ultimately, Wynne would be responsible as the vice postulator, again, uh, the person guiding the cause on the local level, um, for a group of eight men who have alternately been known as the Jesuit martyrs of New France, uh, the North American martyrs, or depending on where you're from, the Canadian martyrs. Wynne had been director of a shrine devoted to two of those men or to the uh, deaths rather of two of those men. The shrine was actually for Our Lady, but it commemorated 
the deaths of two of those men, Isaac Jogue and René Goupil, at the site of their martyrdom in 1646 in what is now New York State. John Wynne was part of the Jesuits' elaborate saint-making machine, which was envied and resented by many of those outside of their congregation. One U.S. priest named Edward McSweeney in 1891 complained that the Jesuits were actually too assiduous in targeting prospective saints and in anticipating the measures that would facilitate a future cause of canonization. He complained that these practices resulted in a Jesuit monopoly among canonized saints. McSweeney's real concern though, involved not a congregational dominance, but geographical underrepresentation. By the late 19th century, 17 men and women from Central and South America had been canonized by the Catholic Church. Yet not a single person from either the United States or Canada was even being considered for that honor. U.S. Catholics blame the disparity not on an absence of holiness, but on a dearth of resources. Without monarchs or wealthy communities to undertake the long and often expensive investigations demanded at Rome, one grumbled, it was no wonder that no servant of God who lived or labored in any part of our continent lying north of the Rio Grande had ever been nominated for canonization. Some North Americans proposed creative solutions, suggesting that the Holy See appoint a special group of cardinals to glorify the hidden saints of the countries that came from countries that did not have the resources to sponsor a cause. Renowned church historian, John Gilmary Shea, recognized that the elaborate process of canonization posed a particular challenge for North American saint seekers. Shea noted that while persons of eminent sanctity have flourished in Canada and the United States from the time of the earliest settlement, the condition of the North American church of the last century has taxed the resources of Catholics in both countries. This had certainly obtained in the case of the Jesuit martyrs who had been uh, uh, murdered in New France during the same decade of Jogues and Goupil, in men like Jean de Brebeuf. These, the cause of these men had actually been open under the Archdiocese of Rouen in 1652. But once the Diocese of Quebec was created, the authority transferred to the Bishop of Quebec. And while he was personally devoted to the martyrs, building a mission church meant that he had little energy or capital to devote to their cause. England's victory over France in 1763, followed by the suppression of the Jesuits, further diminished the Jesuits' chances of canonization. And in fact, it was not until the restoration of the Jesuits and the publication of the Jesuit relations uh, in the mid 19th century that the cause was revived. John Gilmary Shea had been a member of the Jesuit community in Montreal and he became the leading U.S. advocate for the martyrs' canonization. He presented them as the patrons, pr prospective patrons, of both Canada and the United States. Unlike existing saints, he said, who were far removed by ages or by oceans, the Jesuits had lived and labored and sanctified themselves in our land among circumstances familiar. One particular saint emerged as a flashpoint as Catholics in the United States and Canada searched for a saint of their own. Canonized in 1671 as the first saint from the New World, Rose of Lima had been proclaimed patron of all the Americas from Cape Horn to Alaska. But late 19th century Catholics in Canada in the United States paid Rose scant attention. And in fact, one priest convinced that most were actually unaware of Rose's patronage, urged church leaders to make a greater effort to generate devotion to her. In fact, most North American Catholics were less inclined to embrace Rose of Lima than they were to replace her, quite literally, with a Rose of their own. The desire for a North American analog to Rosa Lima prompted the rechristening of Philippine Duchenne a French-born sister of the Sacred Heart who worked as a missionary on the Missouri frontier between 1818 until her death in 1852. Duchenne had been baptized Rose Philippine, but according to French custom, was 
uh, never actually called Rose during her life. In her afterlife, however, it became a convenient way to underscore the need for a North American saint. One U.S. saint seeker pleaded with the Holy See in 1891 to proclaim Duchenne a Saint Rose of Missouri for these United States. The tag provides a classic example of how a canonization process can illuminate the priorities of a saint's supporters, even as it obfuscates details about the saint herself. Duchenne had not been called Rose in her life, but in her afterlife, it became a way to argue that she too had met the European standards of sanctity and therefore should be canonized. Of course, the leading female can candidate for canonization in the 19th century was not a rose, but a lily. Lily of the Mohawks was the nickname of Tequiquita, a native uh, convert to Catholicism who had been born in uh, the same village that Isaac Shogue and René Goupil had been martyred. She had been born uh, there 10 years after their death. And as such, their stories were intertwined as she was cast as the first fruit of their blood. Tekaguita, Jogues, and Gupil were linked formally for the very first time in 1884, when U.S. bishops meeting in Baltimore for the Third Plenary Council humbly begged Pope Leo XIII to initiate the causes of these three people so, and they emphasize the spiritual benefits that would accrue from the introduction of the cause by the Holy See, emphasizing that having models of holiness drawn from their very midst would inspire the devotion of the faithful in the country and afford it native patrons. Note that there was an identical petition sent from Canadian bishops, more evidence that U.S. and Canadian Catholics viewed the quest for a native patron um, as a shared a shared search. They understood it as a way to pay, uh, to pit what they believed was a saint-deprived culture in North America against a saint-saturated one south of the Rio Grande. Many Catholics in the United States and Canada cheered the introduction of this petition, um, celebrating it as a chance to give Catholics in the United States and Canada the Irish equivalent of St. Patrick or Bridget or the French analog of Saint Louis or Jean Vieve. However, the petition generated a negative reaction among non-US Catholics. The editors of the, sorry, non-Catholics in the United States. The editors of the Methodist Review, for example, urged all thoughtful Protestants to beware of what this portended and to work against the movement to canonize so-called Americans. They worried about what doors this would open. If these people were canonized, the editors wrote, the next Americans would be more closely allied in race to the present, present superstitious masses of our country, Catholics of Irish or Italian extraction. This was a decade when immigration from Europe uh, was increasingly dominated by Catholics from Southern and Eastern Europe and the Irish, of course, um, had been despised since uh, by many Americans since they started to arrive in large numbers in the 1840s. This kind of reaction did not surprise leading Catholics like John Gilmary Shea, who recognized that in seeking to name an American saint, Catholics in either Canada or the United States would not only have to contend with a daunting and costly process, but with the contempt of a Protestant government in Canada and a Protest Protestant supremacy in the, in, in the United States. Many outspoken anti-Catholics reserved special scorn for sainthood and had long viewed the prospect of an American saint as a travesty, if not an outright contradiction in terms. Some, in fact, some Americans, some North Americans despaired of ever securing a canonized saint. The fact that canonization smacks too much of Rome, one woman observed, made it impossible for Catholics to even venerate the old saints properly in the US and Canada, let alone try to launch the cause of a new one. But by the late 19th century, an increasing number of Catholics began to argue precisely the opposite. Namely, that the extensive documentation required for a cause and the publicity it generated 
represented an unparalleled opportunity to weave the Catholic religion more seamlessly into the American fabric. Canonization is, among other things, a marketing strategy, how to encourage devotion to a person beyond their immediate circle. And an American saint could potentially provide a double model, one that would not only convince Vatican officials of American holiness, but also persuade skeptical Protestants of Catholic, that Catholics belonged in uh, in North America. And so scholars have taken with them, most notably the historian Alan Greer has made this argument in charting what he calls her post-mortem naturalization as an American citizen. He describes her as the perfect antidote to nativist perceptions of the church as foreign, industrial, and urban. Her cult developed specifically at a time when immigrants from Southern and Eastern Europe were flooding the country and gravitating toward urban areas. Tequequita allowed Catholics to tell a different Catholic story about North America, one that was different from what prevailed in the American Protestant imagination. She testified that Catholics had been here since the early days of settlement. Of course, it wasn't just Tequequita, but also the agents of her conversion, the North American martyrs, more about them in a minute, but also celebrated were foundresses of, Amer of North American religious orders and particularly three women from Canada, Mary of the Incarnation, whose cause was beat for beatification was introduced in 1877, Margu Marguerite Bergois, cause opened in 1869, and also Marie Marguerite Duville, whose cause was also opened in the 1880s. The attention given to the opening of these causes was the same both in the United States and Canada. They were not seen as Canadian saints, but as North American saints who could help demonstrate that Catholicism had been part of, had been present on the North American uh, continent since the earliest days of settlement. Now, the causes of these four women, the three foundresses and Tequequita, um, did not move forward very quickly because of uh, what was then tradition, but would be codified in canon law in 1917, uh, a clause that stipulated that women could not represent uh, causes for canonization themselves at the Holy See. Women could not serve as postulators. Uh, they had to act through male proxies. And so the causes of women um, typically move slower. And I'm gonna talk more about this in my second lecture next month, but it was uh, one of the factors that led to the fact that the causes of all of these women took more than a century. Um, guess which congregation uh, moved quickly and never made mistakes uh, as some of the uh, as, as some of the women's congregations did and as some of the less, uh, the congregations that were less versed in saint seeking in the United States, the Jesuits. With John Wynne at the helm, um, the cause of the North American martyrs moved fairly quickly. In fact, it was Wynne who decided to separate Tequequita from Isaac Jogue and Goupil, as had been the case in that petition, and yoke them instead to six confreres who had perished in similarly grisly fashion, but in what became Canada. Of course, the fact that uh, these men, once their martyrdom had been established, were exempt from one of the required miracles, they moved fairly quickly and were beatified in 1925. It seemed like another Jesuit saintly success story. Or was it? More than a simple precursor to canonization, beatification permits limited public veneration, allowing a designated segment of the local church to celebrate their feast days or to erect statues in their honor or to invoke their intercession publicly. Exactly who may venerate a blessed is stipulated by the sacred congregation of rites in the decree of beatification. And typically it is granted to a particular diocese or religious congregation. In the case of the Jesuit martyrs, it was extended to Catholics within all Canadian dioceses and those within the province of New York state. 
In an unusual provision, the congregation added that US Catholics living outside the New York province would also be able to venerate the martyrs publicly, provided their local ordinary simply asked for permission. According to John Wynne, this gesture reflected the Vatican's awareness that canonization of the Jesuit martyrs had special meaning for all North Americans. Wynne's first indication that this might not be the case came from a frustrating exchange he had with Philadelphia's Dennis Dougherty, who's pictured in this slide. Um, uh, yeah, right there, the, the, the larger man in the center. Hoping to capitalize on Dougherty's influence, Wynne wrote to the Cardinal repeatedly in 1926 and 1927, urging him to submit the request to venerate the martyrs publicly. Dougherty ignored Wynne's appeals for 18 months, and when he did respond, he referred to the cause as that of the Canadian martyrs. Dougherty's word choice was merely one sign that the cooperative spirit between Canadian and U.S. saint seekers, so decisive in the late 19th century, had substantially eroded by the 1920s. The causes of the North American martyrs had become popular at a time when U.S. Catholics felt closely allied to their Canadian counterparts, and relied on continental boundaries rather than national borders to define an American saint. But by the time the martyrs were beatified in 1925, published material about the Jesuits in the United States increasingly presented them as part of the Canadian story. One priest predicted, accurately as it happens, that US Catholics would be little interested in the martyrs because they had been French people whose exploits and adventures did not touch Americans. Jesuit Michael Lyons admitted that his martyred confreres were probably not sufficiently appreciated by US Catholics. Nevertheless, he appealed to his fellow citizens to do all we can to promote the causes of those who have lived and died in our country, in the United States. In some of my favorite notations about this, many US Catholics pointed out that the Jesuit martyrs had never become naturalized citizens of the United States. Now, anachronisms are quite common in studies of canonization, but the observation that the French Jesuit martyrs had never become naturalized citizens of the United States, which was not founded till over a century after their deaths, is particularly revealing. Rather than welcome the beatification of Jogues and Goupil as the fulfillment of a long search for their first saint, US Catholics interpret it as reason to approach that quest with renewed vigor for an entirely different kind of saint. Saint seekers now had a new target, a canonized saint who labored in the words of one Jesuit, under the stars and stripes. So what you have here is a really interesting example of a disconnect between a church that moves very, very slowly, in this case through the canonization process, and a culture that moves very quickly and, and, and changes very easily. The causes of the North American martyrs moved with lightning speed by the standards of canonization. But in the space between the time when their cause was introduced and the time they were beatified, US culture had changed so much. And we can think about the reasons why the Great War certainly helped define a national identity. Um, the establishment of the appointment of clergymen like Cardinal Dougherty who were named a cardinal, the United States had three cardinals by 1925. Um, this would contribute to Catholics wanting, you Catholics in the United States wanting a nation saint, a saint of their own. The Jesuit martyrs no longer qualified on that. You can see this in lots of ways and I won't go into all of them, but the cause of a redemptress named John Newman um, had started also in the 1880s, but the redemptress made boatloads of mistakes in pursuing his cause. They didn't have someone as talented as John Wynne advising them and his cause languished. But in the 1930s, you can see this is just one example of how John Newman's connection to the nation became more and more important. Whereas in the 1880s, US Catholics were seeking the saints who had antedated the nation, by the 1930s, they were focusing on the saints who had embraced the nation. And you can see here Newman, who was from Philadelphia, Cardinal Dougherty was actually a supporter of him. They're linking his cause to national historic revolutionary sites.
And there were pilgrimages that you could pilgrimages that you could take to Newman Shrine and pair it with a field trip to a revolutionary battlefield. Um, the North American martyrs continued to move very quickly and were canonized just five years after the beatification. Once the miracles attributed to them, again, significantly miracles uh, that that happened to Canadians, they were canonized in 1930. And Wynne uh, kept going, despite his fellow citizens' apathy and Cardinal Dougherty's nonchalance, he realized that now, by with their elevation to the universal calendar of the saints, U.S. Catholics no, no longer needed a special dispensation to celebrate their feast day. So he demonstrated, he, he, distributed quite a bit of promotional material encouraging U.S. Catholics to venerate them. It is a pity the martyrs are not better known, he lamented in a letter to American pastors. It took time and labor to bring about their canonization. It is well worth the time and labor to have our people know and invoke them. Wynne sent reminders in 1937 about Jogues' feast day to every U.S. bishop and to 13,000 pastors and 800 school leaders. And he would continue to promote the North American martyrs as the only saints of North America for some time to come. However, it was clear that they wouldn't be the only saints of North America much longer. Cardinal uh, Carlo Michinelli, a postulator at the Sacred Congregation, reported that uh, this was in 1937, that the Holy See was at that moment considering more than a dozen causes from the United States. Of these, he identified the Huron Indian maiden as the most promising. She was in fact, Tequiquita was the lone American he named in his report. This of course was music to the ears of John Wynne. Having uh, proceeded, having succeeded with the canonization of the Jesuits, he turned to Tecaquita's cause, which had languished uh, or had been deferred until the 1930s. And he listened to reports from Rome indicating that she would indeed be the next American canonized. It turns out that he should have listened more carefully to what his fellow Jesuit was saying about who the next American saint would be. Leonard Feeney, his colleague at Fordham University, uh, in a homily he preached from St. Patrick's Cathedral in New York, talked about the need for an American saint taken right from our midst, a saint who was a subject of our nation, a saint who spoke our idiom. So a saint who belonged to the United States specifically. He never mentioned the North American martyrs, again, members of his own congregation. So you can imagine how angry this made John Wynne. Feeney's favorite candidate was Elizabeth Ann Seton, um, a woman who I will talk about a great deal more in my second lecture, but he argued that Elizabeth of New York would be the first saint of its kind, an American saint. Seton's promoters were trying to revive her cause after a long delay that had a lot to do with the provision that women couldn't uh, sponsor their own causes. But the superior general of the Vincentian community that was overseeing Seton's cause, like so many other American saint seekers, wrote to John Wynne to ask his advice. Wynne might have responded generously had he known what, less generously to that request, had he known what the superior was saying about the status of Seton's cause. Um, in a letter to Seton supporters, Charles Suve, again, the uh, the superior general of the Vincentians, said that another cause is being pressed forward, that of a young Indian girl, Tequiquita. She is not an American. Mother Seton was an American. All our Americans of today are descended from Europeans. So in the United States, Tequiquita was dismissing Tequiquita, the woman formerly defined as the quintessential American, as someone who is not quite American enough. This was a very common perception when U.S. saint seekers began to talk not about sponsoring an indigenous saint or a saint who was associated with the European missionary enterprise, but a saint who was associated with the immigration experience. 
Tequequita and the agents of her conversion had emerged as the early favorite candidates for the first American saint in the 1880s because, as I said, at a time when Catholics were dismissed as recent and unwelcome visitors, they established a Catholic presence in North America from the earliest days of its history. But from the vantage point of the mid 20th century with members of most American Catholic ethnic groups into their second, third or fourth generation, the participation in the colonial missionary enterprise would carry far less weight in US saintly circles. US Catholics had revised their American story from a narrative that foregrounded European missionaries into one that foregrounded immigrants and the nation. Another element in Seton's favor was that she was a distant cousin of Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who was of course president in the 1930s. Viewed from the perspective of the Holy See, where sanctity is evaluated through the validity of witness testimony, authenticity of miracles, extensive documentation, the canonization process can appear immutable. The pace of saint making might ebb and flow and the system is subject to modification. The criteria for holiness are often presented as existing apart from time and space. One authority insisted in 1925 no popular acclaim, no national rivalry can make saints. The process is slow, deliberate, and strictly judicial. When we look at sanctity through the lens of the local church, however, sanctity appears far more fluid and historically contingent. The culture in which the faithful live shapes the saints they embrace, and changes in that culture shape who their favorite saints are. Whether or not causes succeed, not only depend on how well their holiness passes muster at the center, but also on how easily their stories can be adapted, in this case, to fit the American story that Catholics wanted to tell about themselves. I just want to mention one humorous thing um, uh, that demonstrates, like Tekakwith is the way a popular saint, candidate for canonization, lost um, traction in the course of a generation. Philippine Duchenne, Rose Philippine Duchenne, was beatified in 1940. She eventually, her congregation eventually found Jesuits to agree to work on her cause, and she was beatified. But it was not a national celebration in the United States. It was mostly confined to St. Louis, Missouri, where she had died, and to uh, places where her congregation, the Religious or the Sacred Heart, had establishments. One Jesuit was really angry about US Catholics lack of interest in the splendid heroism of Philippine Duchenne. In what was undoubtedly wishful thinking, he urged them to put aside the best-selling Gone with the Wind and pick up a new history of the Society of the Sacred Heart, insisting that Duchenne's adventures were comparable to Scarlett O'Hara's in their elements of romance and heroism. I wanna uh, just talk briefly about a, a, another beatification that occurred during this period, the beatification of Francis Cabrini, a late entry in the quest for the first American saint. The Italian born nun had not even arrived in the United States until 1889, by which point the causes of the Jesuit martyrs and Philippine Duchenne and Tequequita were well underway. Yet she would leapfrog all of them, beatified in 1938, a mere 21 years after her death, which required an exemption from the provision that required that the provision in canon law that required 50 years had to elapse between a candidate's death and his or her beatification. US Catholics celebrated wildly on both occasions, her beatification in 1938 and in July, 1946, when Pope Pius XII canonized her. There was no trace of ambiguity or detachment. They accepted Cabrini as their first American saint. So again, the martyrs, Jesuit martyrs had been canonized in 1930, but by this point, Cabrini was presented as the first American saint, not Jogues and Goupil, even though they had died on American soil. And just, I wanna run through, this was a mural of Cabrini that was painted by a, um, a Works Progress Administration, a New Deal artist in the 1930s that pictures her in an urban setting. Again, in the 1880s, the attraction of the French missionaries and Tequequita was that they were not associated with urban areas. But for Cabrini, that became part of her appeal. And she was viewed, this particular image is called Saints of the, Among the Skyscrapers 
in which she is presented as an urban denizen. The Cardinal Archbishop of Chicago, where Cabrini died, had died in 1917, uh, had this to say on the 20th anniversary of her death in 1952. We think of sanctity as being something you find a way far off in distant country. But here in the heart of this great metropolis lived Mother Cabrini, where the elevated trains and all their noise rushed past. Nothing far off, a saint here in Chicago, coping with the same conditions and difficulties which surround us in our own lives. No city was more important to Cabrini's story than Seattle, Washington, where, had she, be, where she had become a naturalized citizen in 1909 unlike the Jesuit martyrs who had never done that. Cabrini never explained her motive for seeking naturalization and evidence suggests that her lawyer had suggested it would be far easier for her to acquire property if she was a US citizen. But for US Catholics, they imputed different moments to her attributing her naturalization to Cabrini's attachment to the United States and her embrace of the American mentality it's hard to do justice to this image, which uh, the original is in the Vatican secret archives, actually now called the Vatican Apostolic Archives. This is a map um, that's truly splendid. Cabrini's 67 foundations across three continents are documented on this map, as well as her 24 ocean crossings that she made. And uh, it's embossed in gold, it's truly splendid. When you look at this map, it's clear that the United States was not the center of Cabrini's world, but for U.S. Catholics who were seeking a saint of their own, she belonged particularly to them. In 1890, John Gilmary Shea had insisted that U.S. Catholics would find solace in the canonization of Jesuit missionaries, the saints who had lived and labored and sanctified themselves in our land among circumstances familiar. Shea could not have predicted that half a century later, these missionaries would appear almost as distant to U.S. Catholics as medieval saints did. It was Francis Cabrini, the immigrant. She was technically a missionary, but she was characterized as an immigrant. The saint among the skyscrapers, and above all, the proud US citizen who would capture the American imagination. Pius XII in 1950 um, canonized Marguerite Bergois as the first uh, female Canadian saint. And here's a wonderful picture of um, her relics being transported, uh, being loaded onto a plane. And in fact, over the next uh, few decades, all three of the women whose causes were introduced, the Canadian women whose causes were introduced in the late 19th century were beatified and canonized, although Maria of the Incarnation was quite recently by Pope Francis in 2014. These were barely mentioned in the US Catholic press. And again, that contrast between the 1880s when they were embraced as North American saints, they had become by this point, Canadian saints. I promised to end with the canonization of Tecaguita, and I will do that now. As I said, being there in 2012 was a very moving experience. And um, I want to uh, say that I was invited to two parties. I was invited to the American, the party sponsored by the U.S. Embassy to the Holy See and the party sponsored by the Canadian Embassy to the Holy See. And I can tell you that the Canadian party was more fun. But speaking at that later party was Phil Fontaine, then the former chief of the Assembly of First Nations. And he got up to give a, a speech at this party, which had happened after the canonization. This is technically this canonization banner, uh, the one that hung from the balcony of St. Peter's. And he talked about this moment, that moment in 2012, as a bookend to a visit he had made to Rome three years before, where he had made, um, he had an appointment with Pope Benedict and accepted from him an apology on behalf of the Catholic Church for the treatment of indigenous children in Canadian schools, uh, church-sponsored schools. And Fontaine said, I see these two visits as intimately connected. They have apologized. We have accepted their forgiveness. And today in canonizing one of our daughters, we walk forward together into the future. It was a really powerful moment and a reminder of how important saints can be as symbols. And Dr. Adams began with the acknowledgement and a, a desire for reconciliation of what it means to be and to teach and learn on indigenous lands. And for me, that was a very powerful reminder of how saints themselves can present opportunities for reconciliation and how they're presented anew. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Dr. Cummings. It's a fascinating presentation and I would like to invite audience members to uh, post their questions uh, at the bottom of the Zoom call. There's the Q&A and you can just write in your question and I'll be reading them as we go along. But I, I do wanna you know, say it was too bad you, you haven't been able to be in Winnipeg for your lecture. Phil Fontaine, one of his jogging routes is down Wellington Crescent. And maybe if you're out- No way. Come oh. across Phil Fontaine, so. <laughs> Oh, I, yeah, I still I still get a chill when I think about that moment, um, how uh, how poignant it was. And and I know that there are other interpretations of her canonization. There are some um, some indigenous people who did not think it was a good idea. So it, it's a complex thing, but I'll, I'll never forget that moment. Great. So I'm just monitoring the uh, the chats and the Q&A. But I, I do want to ask you about about. Um, Filipina Duchesne, am I saying that right? Yes, Philip Duchesne, yeah. Duchesne, so so, was the book as good as, as Gone with the Wind? <laughs> Did you read it and, and what was your... your uh, <laughs> I have read it. It's a wonderful history, a really important, the Society of the Sacred Heart is a really important congregation, but no, I'm afraid it's not. Scarlett O'Hara is not the uh, person that comes to mind, but I do think it's an interesting comparison because um, it, saints are like figures in popular culture and they can be uh, presented as such. So I, I think again, that the Jesuit um, who was writing in, in a Jesuit journal, um, I think it was a bit of wishful thinking and a sense that she was really important to him and he couldn't understand why his fellow citizens weren't more excited about that. Great. So I have a, a question from uh, Dr. Chris Herenko, who's a, a professor who teaches up at uh, University of Saskatchewan. And he asks, is there a potential for a North American saint today or are Canadian and US identities too fractured? Oh, I would love to think there was a potential. And I, I can tell you being there at Brother Andre's canonization, I never felt more Canadian in my life and more, more of a solidarity. Um, I think I'd take your question just a step further and say that I'm not sure there's a potential for an American saint or a Canadian saint today when um, our identities are, it, it's difficult to conceive. I mean, there, there actually is no patron saint of the United States um, because patronage is something that happens after canonization. Is it, You can only have someone declare a patron. And so while the United States is under the protection of Our Lady of the Immaculate Conception and has been since 1846, there is no um, person who lived and, and labored in the United States who's officially declared the patron. I believe the Jesuit martyrs are officially patrons of Canada along with St. Joseph and, and others. But so I guess I don't have, I, I, I would agree that identities are too fractured uh, even within Canada and the United States. And to think of a saint that could cross that our Northern border, or, I, I don't think so. Good. So uh, one of our professors here, Christine Butterall, who actually is part of our Hanley Selection Committee, and she was <laughs> of, of asking you to be one of our, our lecturers, but, but she points out the patron of Canada is St. Joseph. And, uh, but she does ask the question, do you think that if Kateri had been canonized earlier, that indigenous relations would have been more positive over the years in Canada and the US. And she says, thank you to, your, to you for your presentation. Oh, you're welcome and thank you. I hope you're not having regrets at having selected me. Um, yeah, so yes, what, what is interesting about her cause is that, um, that indigenous people were not engaged, as engaged as they should have been um, and she was presented as a national figure. And it really was only in the 1970s when indigenous people were sponsoring the cause, um, involved in sponsoring the cause. And of course that coincided with the papacy of John Paul II who beatified technically the, in 1980 without the required miracle as a way to gesture to the importance. And I'll talk more about that in my third lecture, but John Paul II understood better than any of his predecessors that longing for that, that people in, in places that don't have a saint of their own, that longing for it, and part of his remedy was canonizing uh, more people. So that is why he, uh, why he canonized her. So yes, I think, um, I, I, I think that had indigenous people been more engaged, 
back in the 1930s, John Wynne, as I've tried to say, was a very good postulator and he could have gotten the job done. He finished her posizio in her, the documentation about her cause in 1940. And uh, I think if she had had broader support then, she may have been canonized uh, well, well before 2012. So it's a great question. Great. Uh, one of our star graduates, uh, Benedicte Lemaitre, uh, she asks a, a question. What is the name of the book on St. Philippine Duchesne? The book is by Louise Callan and it's uh, actually a history of the Society of the Sacred Heart. Um, so it's not about Philippine Duchesne per se, although she was the person who brought the congregation to the United States. This is uh, the Callan, C-A-L-L-A-N, is a book uh, that's about the history of the society in the United States. But there are uh, many books by on Philippine Duchenne. One of my favorites is by Catherine Mooney, uh, which was written around the time of her canonization in 1988. I hope uh, you'll come back for the second lecture because I'm gonna focus on Duchenne as uh, a really great exemplar, among others, of the tension in how saints express a lot of the tension uh, in terms of gender and the American Catholic Church. Great. So I have a, a comment from Emmanuel uh, uh, Lebe Francis. Sorry if I mispronounced it, uh, Emmanuel, but he says, I just want to say this lecture made me appreciate and understand our first saints in history more, which was the point, right? <laughs> Kathleen and Christopher Adams do have a great day. So anyway, that's more of a comment. Um, Catherine Fisher uh, says, just curious, what was the criteria required for someone who represented or was an accurate representation of American when being considered for canonization? You had mentioned Seton being considered over uh, Kateri uh, because Seton was rooted in European descent. Was that it? Thanks for an informative and thought provoking presentation. That's a great question, Catherine. And uh, the, the actual, it changes. The criteria for American, American changes quite rapidly, far more rapidly than causes for canonization move. So it's actually, flipped. In the 19th century, Elizabeth Ann Seton's cause was first proposed in 1882, and she had a disadvantage uh, over Tekakwita because Seton, Seton was in fact the only candidate from either the United States or Canada who was not connected with the colonial missionary enterprise. She had been born in then the British colonies in 1774. So she was at a disadvantage, and that's part of the reason why her cause didn't move forward. Tekakwita was the uh, was the American. She had been converted by European missionaries. But by the 1930s, it had flipped exactly. Tekakwita, at least, now remember, the person that wrote that quote was the person in charge of Seton's cause. So he had a vested interest. And it's sad to say, you know, when you study canonization, it's all about holiness, right? But there's often many unholy elements in it. And one of them is this edging out, you know, well, my saint is more relevant than this saint. And that's what he was trying to do. He was trying to say Seton is the true American. Her story conforms with the American story in a way that technically does, does not. So it flipped. Um, the criteria changed quite rapidly. And in this point, you know, over, over half a century. Great. So, so um, someone raised uh, his or her hand. Uh, if you could put the question in the Q&A box, that would be the best. But uh, Jacinta Dakar uh, asks, what congregation does St. Kateri belong to? Actually, she did not belong to a congregation. She died at a very young age. She was only 24 when she died. And she was not, uh, although there's some indications in, uh, in the Jesuit relations and, and in her spiritual confessors that she had a desire to embrace religious life. She never did. So therefore, she is the only uh, lay person. She's a member not of a religious community who's a canonized saint from the United States. And uh, I, now I have to laugh and I hope you, you won't um, think this is sacrilegious, but um, I, I do think you can find and you can find all sorts of things about saints, but she's often presented Tekakwita as the patron saint of single women because she in fact was single. And I just, I find that kind of funny because of course being a single woman in the 21st century um, is quite a bit different from being a single woman in New France in the 1670s. So, uh, but this is nonetheless, uh, she is the only one who has that distinction of not being a member of a religious congregation. Only one from North, uh, from North America. 
That's interesting. So I have a question from Dr. Emika Stasmary. Uh, she's the Emeritus President of our university here and a valued member of our faculty here at St. Paul's College and a, um, uh, an anthropologist. So be careful about your answer. But <laughs> she, she says, uh, Dr. Nancy Shoemaker wrote a fascinating article about Kateri, uh, uh, St. Kateri and has argued that her behavior fits with behavior of Mohawks who sought spiritual power. Could not more be made of that for she appeals across cultural boundaries. Absolutely, more can and, and should be made of that. Um, as, I, as I suggested, I'm not, um, it, it, it's not so much Kateri's life about which we know because of the Jesuit, her Jesuit confessors, we know quite a bit. But what I was focusing on is how, um, how she changed in historical memory. And certainly if you follow that along today, what do we need? Uh, we, we need more of uh, exemplars who, um, as you say, are seek spiritual power and representation. Uh, with, within churches. So yes, I think that, that she is in the process of being reinvented uh, as, and every generation reinvents their saints, I think. So, so this next question kind of is linked to that and maybe you want to hear it and then you can say whether you've answered it or not. Yeah. But as you have explored the intersection of canonization and nationalism, I am curious about how we might consider, and this is from Nicholas Jessen, I'm curious about how we might consider the manipulation of Kateri's cause in a post-colonial perspective. Absolutely, uh, uh, very important. And although I ended um, with, with Phil Fontaine and the positive interpretation of that, uh, it, it, in his interpretation of seeing her canonization as a cause for reconciliation, there are other ways to interpret that. I would highly recommend the work of my colleague, Dr. Emma Anderson, who has written a book on the, um, on the Jesuit martyrs, the death and afterlife of the Jesuit martyrs. And she makes a really compelling case and taps into, she knows more about it than I do, but taps into a movement to canonize many of the indigenous people who died along with the Jesuits in New France? Um, you know whether the Jesuits were martyrs, you know, in the in the true definition, who died in hatred of the faith is highly debatable. They died in the wars of, uh, of they died as a result of colonial wars, and they were not the only people who died. Many of their lay associates and converts died along with them. So uh, we have clericalism in here as well, uh, clericalism and uh, cultural, um, uh, yes, I, so it, to, to diversify the canon of the saints by recognizing other people, it makes sense um, at why the Jesuits advanced, but really many of the, it's interesting, there's a cause open from, um, from Flor Florida, the, um, the Diocese of Tallahassee, that's called the cause for canonization of the United States martyrs. And it was proposed, um, it was proposed in 1930, right after the Jesuit martyrs were canonized. And it's the uh, causes of the US martyrs. Most of them were Franciscans. So there was definitely competition, congregational competition here. The Jesuits had their guys, the Franciscans wanted theirs. And it was originally 119 people who were almost all Franciscan missionaries. And that has been um, reduced, that number has been reduced to include a much more narrow geographic area and has been uh, included lay people uh, in many of whom were indigenous as well. So that is another interesting analog, but absolutely. Um, yeah, there's multiple ways to interpret Kateri's manipulation. I, I guess saints are always manipulated <laughs> um, and they become, uh, they become their stories. And I guess I just want to say this, this became really clear to me when I traveled to Brother Andre's canonization, which was a very meaningful event spiritually for me, but also launched me on this project. And once I got into how uh, really the sinfulness that's in a lot of causes for canonization and the manipulation and all that, it just became really clear to me that none of this diminishes the holiness of the saints themselves, um, that whenever you have humans involved and canonization is a human process, you're going to have sin and jealousy and manipulation and uh, things that aren't very good. But, um, but spiritually, it's almost like the holiness of these candidates really shines through all that. So I think back to the question about um, Tekakwita as a model for a woman who sought spiritual power uh, might be a really great anecdote to some of her manipulate the way she's been manipulated. Yeah. So, so the human side, what Isaiah Berlin would say, the crooked timber of humanity. 
<laughs> yes, yes. So there are a few other uh, questions that have come in and uh, one is from an anonymous attendee and she or he says, I understand that some of your background is in gender studies, which may have influenced your presentation, but I'm wondering about your selection of women in your presentation. Was there a surplus of women brought forward as saints in the context of North America? If so, is there a reason that women are represented more frequently in the North American context other than the Jesuit martyrs? That's a great question. And one, I don't have a very good answer to, but I can tell you that in the United States of the 12 people that uh, are canonized who lived within what is now the present day United States, the majority are women. Francis Cabrini is considered the first American citizen saint, Elizabeth Ann Seton, the first American born saint, um, Catherine Drexel, who's a saint I'll talk about um, in my final lecture, became um, the first saint born in the United States, which is kind of a technical thing, reflecting the fact that Seton was actually born in, <laughs> in the British colonies. Um, so I think it's a wonderful example of how saints can flip the script. So certainly when we think about gender representation in the Catholic church, uh, we don't think of a, a majority. Um, Flannery O'Connor once was asked about sexism in the Catholic church and she said, uh, I don't wanna, uh, don't tell me that the church is just as likely to canonize a woman as a man. And she was actually wrong about that in the whole canon of the saints, there are about um, only 25% are women. But in North America, it is a majority of women. And, and so I think that's, that's an interesting thing um, to look at, but it, it's not that I featured them more in my presentation. It is that, that they, were, they were more dominant. Um, this also occurred to me, this was something I began thinking about at Andre's canonization. The very first saint from the Congregation of Holy Cross, the teaching congregation was virtually, virtually illiterate. Um, which is, is just a way of, of flipping the script, I think. Um, and, and I came to appreciate that. So the founder of Holy Cross is, is not yet canonized, who was, of course, a very learned man. Maybe, because, maybe the reason why there are so many women is they're more patient than men. <laughs> so Judith McDonald, uh, um, just short question, is a female allowed to be a postulator? As of 1983, yes. So I hope you'll come back to next month's lecture where I will talk about that. When John Paul II revised the uh, process, he did make it possible for a woman to become a postulator. Now that said, very few women become postulators. And a lot of that has to do with, despite what I just said about there being more female candidates for canonization um, for most of the 20th century. Now, many women's religious congregations are not devoting resources to canonization. I think of Maria of the Incarnation as an example. As I said, she was beatified, or as it was on my slide, she was beatified in 1980. But her congregation, the Ursulines of Quebec, were not doing a whole lot to promote it because they determined that their priorities um, lay elsewhere. And it was Pope Francis who decided to canonize her in 2014. So the same thing happened with Philippine Duchenne. It was not her congregation that was working for her cause. John Paul II needed a U.S. saint, and he pushed it forward. So long answer to a very uh, short question, but yes, now women can be, as of, as of 1983. That's great. So here's a question from Sister Elaine Beatty. Uh, Sister Elaine was the past director of our campus ministry and was, is with the Grey Nuns in Montreal at their head office. She's, oh, okay. <laughs> she's been promoted up. Uh, but she, she says, you mentioned that in the 1917 canon law, it took 50 years of waiting required before canonization. Did the 1983 code change that since recently there have been canonizations much that are much quicker? Absolutely, Sister Lane. John Paul II did change that. Um, you, you might know he canonized more saints than all of his predecessors combined. He canonized 482 people and beatified 1,341, um, and it, which of course led to more canonizations by Pope Benedict and Pope Francis, though, all those people in the queue there. Um, and he did that by simplifying the process. He actually did what that American priest I quoted, Edward McSweeney, suggested um, to make it easier for the church to glorify the hidden saints of countries that were too poor to sponsor their own saints. Um, so I'll talk more a bit about that in my final lecture, but one of the ways he did that was to change that waiting period from 50 years to five years. And even now the Pope can do whatever he wants. So when John Paul II died in 2005, 
Pope Benedict uh, announced that he was going to initiate the cause for canonization. He opened it just 11 days after John Paul II's death. And of course, um, John Paul II had done that in the case of Mother Teresa as well. So popes can still do whatever they want, but it is, it is five, the waiting period is now five years. Great. So I, just a comment from somebody, uh, a uh, Peter Tremblay says, I'm a retired policeman criminologist uh, who has taken up the process of doing daily research of the saints of the day and uses reference uh, the Dictionary of Saints by Philip Nobe, N-O-B-E, and mentions it's only $2 to purchase it. Oh, okay. All right. Thank so, you. Uh, uh, thank you, Peter. Another one uh, uh, comment and question from Dr. Meredith Bacola. Uh, Dr. Bacola is one of the two uh, full-time professors in our Catholic Studies program, which, by the way, is the biggest in all of Canada for Catholic Studies. Wow. Dr. Bacola says, I was very struck in looking at the Jesuit accounts of Takawita's holiness, at the role that her relics played in advancing her cause. What role did traditional classes of relics play in the promotion of her cause or the causes of these other North American saints? Were there tensions between cor corporeal relics and secondary tertiary relics? That's a, a great question. And I just was involved in a conversation here at Notre Dame about the renovation of uh, chapel, the reliquary chapel we have in our basilica, which has uh, fallen out of disuse. And there's a proposal to renovate it, arguing that relics should be more important in the spiritual life um, as they once were. Um, yes, certainly the first class relics, the, the parts of the body um, were, were very important. And I just wanna tell one story, which is, is when I learned how important they were. And it, it relates to the cause of Elizabeth Ann Seton, who again, I mentioned briefly, but I'll talk about more in my second lecture. When her body was exhumed for the first time, 25 years after her death, a group of her sisters um, gathered under, you know, it happened at night, it was all very secret. Her body was being moved to accommodate um, a new building. And uh, the sisters, of course, were desperately hoping that she would be found incorrupt, which is not a requirement for canonization, but it, it helps. Um, it can be a sign of, of holiness. And so this sister in, in Seton's Positio, her reaction is described as they dug open the grave and as the, the it, it had deteriorated. She was not in, incorrupt. It was, she had, she and so this one sister was so distraught that Seton had not remained incorrupt that uh, she asked if she might have one of mother's toe bones for comfort. <laughs> and I just thought, well, things were sure different in 1846 than they are today. When I'm distressed, um, I think a piece of chocolate or something is what I would go for. But I mean, just that, that connection that she yearned for, and she was given a piece of her toe bone to her, hold on to. There are legions of stories about relics that get lost along the way. I showed the, um, the relics being taken onto the plane in preparation for um, Marguerite Bourgeois's uh, beatification. Um, and there are stories of, of people you know, keeping things that they shouldn't have. Um, and the process of authentic authentication of the relics too was, was very convoluted and necessary for any cause to proceed. Great. Uh, from Stefan Leet, and sorry if I'm mispronouncing it, Stefan, uh, with most North American saints coming from the colonial period, do you envision a change in church policy to create more saints and beatifications from the post-Confederation period in Canada or post-independence in the United States? Absolutely, this uh, was just the very first part of, of my lecture series. And I can tell you, I don't have an exact number from Canada and maybe I can find one by the time we're together again. But I can tell you that there are over 80 causes from the United States presently open right now. And by open, that means at various levels, that doesn't mean they're all um, being considered in at the Holy See right now. But, and many of them are, are very contemporary. Again, John Paul II's rule about only a five-year waiting period. He also made it a little, he made the process much more streamlined, a little less expensive. Um, so yes, there are many pe people, what we call contemporary saints. Actually, just in October, uh, this is not from the United States or Canada, but Blessed Carlo Acutis was canonized, um, a 15-year-old boy from Milan. 
um, who became the first millennial saint. He only died uh, just a couple years ago. So yes, I think we are starting to see that. I know there are, are causes of, of children for the, the United States who died very recently that are open. So we can expect that there will be many, many more saints from the United States and Canada. And in that respect, it's kind of funny to think about to, to go back to the 19th century when US and Canadian Catholics were complaining, you know, they weren't taken seriously because they had no saints. Now there's an abundance of saints. But I would argue that they mean something very different. Uh, and this relates perhaps to the first question I was asked. Um, none of them are being presented as American or Canadian, at least as far as I can tell. They're, they're representing various constituencies. And they also signify I think um, where Catholics position themselves spiritually. So whereas before the driving narrative was what did these saints say about us as Americans? Since John Paul II, you see uh, a shift in that. So there are, for example, pro-life saints. There are a number of saints who are uh, poised to become the first African-American saint. Um, so you see it's, it's fracturing, but it's also identity how one positions oneself in relation to the church. So um, Chris Butterall, Christine Butterall um, asks if you will be talking about black elk. Mm -hmm. That's a, a, I don't know that black elk, but maybe. <laughs> um, I, you know, I wasn't, uh, because his cause was introduced so recently and I focus more on the historical causes. That was not someone I planned to talk to, but I do teach about him. I teach a course here at Notre Dame, a first year seminar, writing seminar called Sanctity in Society. And students, as they have to do a lot of things, but um, their major paper is to write about an open cause for canonization and make an argument that their person should be the next American saint. Um, the idea is to the premise that, you know, what are the priorities that we should be focusing on today and which saint embodies that. So I've had students write about Black Elk. And what I find so interesting there, and this relates back to the discussion about Tecuquita as well, is that there are some of his relatives who have um, argued that he shouldn't be canonized, uh, that it is appropriation of his story by the Catholic Church when um, a mountain whose original name I forget was renamed in his honor about five years ago, um, his, his granddaughter, I believe, talked about as that being a more fitting honor for Black Elk than canonization by the Catholic Church. So he is a great example of the way canonization can reflect the priorities of the people promoting or not promoting a cause. People saying he shouldn't be canonized. That's another dynamic that's not operative in the time period I was talking about today, but certainly is now. You actually have people protesting the canonization of subcandidates, saying it's not fitting which is interesting. Well, great, I, I think we've run out of questions. That was, uh, you know, you recall Kathleen, when we were talking a couple of months ago, should we, how do we wanna do this? And you said, well, let's do a sh slightly shorter lecture and have a lot of uh, Q and A. And, and I, th I think you were right on that. I think there was a lot of vibrant questions and, and uh, in addition to a very good lecture. I do know that uh, uh, just one sidebar here that Sister Elaine, who asked one of the questions, she was the, the one of the readers at the at the um, Vatican for the the Saint Kateri canonization. Oh, is it Saint Kateri? Is it um, Marguerite um, Burgoyes? Isn't she the? Okay, maybe that. Yeah, was, yeah. I'm getting things. Yeah, and actually, you had sent me the radio uh, archives radio show of that That's right. organization. And I listened to it uh, and, and really loved it. Again, my focus, what I know about um, her comes from when her cause was introduced in the 19th century, she dropped out of the US story. So it was great to hear that. And uh, wow, a reader, do you know, Sister Elaine, um, the canonization of sister, uh, the canonization of mother Elizabeth Seton in 1975 was the first time a woman was permitted to read at a mass at the Vatican. So um, you were part of a very recent history. Wow. Well, that's great. Well, um, so I, I'm, I think we're all very much looking forward to next month's lecture. And, and I wanna remind everybody in the audience that to, to watch it, you have to re-register to, to get in. But I, I wanna thank you for this great lecture, this great session. And I also wanna thank a, a number of other people. Uh, first, the Handley Lecture Selection Committee, which includes Christine Butterell, John Stapleton, John Stafford, and Daniel McLeod. 
uh, want to thank the logistic committee, including Bonnie Warkentine, Lisa McCausland, and Matt Semshishin. And Matt Semshishin also was a star in handling the marketing and advertising for this lecture. And, and also John Funk, who designed the posters and other materials, which I think were quite, quite nice pieces. Um, I want to thank Jason Brennan, who handled all the technical logistics, and there, there were many, uh, so for setting up this webinar. Chris, also, Chris uh, if I may, Chris, yeah. just mm -hmm. a point of correction, uh, people do not have to re-register for the next lecture. They've registered for all three, so they'll get a reminder notice uh, uh, in the hours before the, uh, the next lecture a month from now. Well, that's great, Jason. Thank and you. Could I interrupt you? Sister yeah. Elaine has chimed in. I'm apologies. Um, <laughs> Marguerite Duville, sorry. Um, I, I confused uh, my, my Marys and Marguerites. Um, so I'm very sorry. And how wonderful that she got a whole day to herself. Um, <laughs> that, uh, that is certainly a testament to her. So thank you for that correction. Sorry for my mistake. Well, no, thanks. Thanks for, for raising that. I also want to thank the founding donors to the Father Hanley Fund and those who continue to donate to make the lecture possible. So if anybody's interested in opening up their wallets, just go to the St. Paul's College Foundation at Canada Helps. If you look up Canada Helps and then go to St. Paul's College Foundation. So just to conclude, thank you, Dr. Sprouse Cummings for your very stimulating and engaging lecture. And thanks, thanks to all of the audience members for being here with us today. And I hope uh, um, all of you can return. So thanks very much. It was a wonderful afternoon. Thank you.